So today we're going to start looking at the origins of civil rights um, and really the civil rights movement that's going to kick off, especially in the 50s and 60s. Is this the first time like civil rights has taken place in the country of America? No, absolutely not. We can also argue that civil rights are still taking place today. I think oftentimes when we look at civil rights, movement, we look at it as sort of a, a black and white issue where it's white Americans and, and black Americans. Um, that's certainly not always the case, you know. Even though I think largely this coming week, the focus is going to be on African Americans during the 50s and 60s. There were also major civil rights movements taking place for women, um, for gay Americans as well. You know, um, Hispanic students, you know, kind of what we call the Chicano movement and things like that. But to kind of understand how the civil rights movement is going to kind of kick off in the 50s and 60s, we're going to have to kind of go back to that Civil War era. So we know that the Civil War is going to take place in 1861. And when it does... Uh, you know, like with the, with the with the Civil War, right? The goal wasn't to end slavery. We often look at it as being like a slavery issue, and slavery was definitely a main issue. Uh, but when the Civil War officially kicked off, Abraham Lincoln, who was the president, was like, you know, his ultimate goal was not to end slavery; it was to preserve the Union. But after a couple of years, he kind of very sort of quickly realized that the only way that we as a country are going to be able to reunite is to end slavery. Right? It's, it's really the only way that's going to happen. Did that mean that people weren't racist? No. Did it mean that suddenly everyone looked favorably upon people of color? No, absolutely not. But I think that there had been sort of a general consensus of slavery isn't right and we're going to have to do something about it. Oftentimes, the Emancipation Proclamation, which was issued in 1863, um, gets a lot of credit for ending slavery. Unfortunately, the Emancipation Proclamation was nice in sentiment, but didn't necessarily officially do anything. It was an executive order, which presidents issue. The problem with executive orders is that they can be reversed or uh, they can be challenged through laws. And so when the Emancipation Proclamation came out in 1863, basically what Lincoln had said was like anyone who's under confederacy order that's a slave is now free but the problem was they're still in the middle of the civil war and so the union aka the north doesn't have any power over the confederacy aka the south so it wasn't until the 13th amendment officially gets passed in 1865 that slavery is legally going to be over in the united states so the 13th amendment officially abolishes slavery throughout the united states this is going to be passed in January of 65, a couple of months before the Civil War officially ends. Once the Civil War ends, America sort of realizes, well, we got to do something, right? You know, now that these people are no longer slaves, how do we ensure equity? How do we ensure that they're going to be treated like American citizens? So that's where the 14th Amendment is officially going to get passed. It's going to give African-American citizenship. Technically, what it rules is that anyone that's born in the United States is automatically guaranteed American citizenship. Um, you'll probably hear about the 14th Amendment. You've either heard about it in the past couple of years or you'll hear about it more recently because people have been talking about getting rid of that provision, um, specifically when it comes to illegal immigration. They're like, hey, these people cross the border. They're only here for like a day. And then if they give birth in America, then they're automatically guaranteed uh, American citizenship. And that has to come back to the 14th Amendment. The problem with the 14th Amendment, and I've mentioned this before, it's incredibly complex. It's not as easy to chalk it up to it gave African-American citizenship. Although that is true, it's a lot more complicated than that um, and something you can kind of delve into in college or even if you're going to law school. You'll, you'll hear quite a bit about the 14th Amendment. And then with the 15th Amendment, it's going to give African-American men the right to vote. So what this meant was that anybody who um, was basically any man would be able to vote. Uh, we know that there's going to be different ways that they're going to try to make sure that these African-American men can't vote. They'll institute things like the grandfather clause, which said if your grandfather didn't vote, neither can you. Well, guess what? All of the grandfathers were slaves, so of course they couldn't vote. They also did things like a literacy test because most of these people were slaves or now former slaves and they never had any access to education. Of course, they weren't able to read. And then, of course, they tried instituting poll taxes, meaning you would have to pay to be able to vote. Well, if you've been working for free your whole life, you also don't have any money. So even though the 15th Amendment is going to give all men the right to vote, um, unfortunately, it, it doesn't really have necessarily a whole lot of weight because different states are going to find different ways to force all men to not be able to vote. And then, of course, we know the group that gets left out of the 15th Amendment is going to be the women. It's not until the 19th Amendment gets passed in 1920 that all women officially have the ability to vote. 
once the Civil War breaks down, we look at things like the Way Davis bill and sort of like both uh, Lincoln and Johnson's Reconstruction plan. A lot of the men who have been charged in the Confederacy, they're going to be disenfranchised, which means they're unable to vote, and they're also unable to hold public office. So as a result, you're going to have the African Americans that for the first time are going to be elected into Congress, which is huge, um, because before then they really couldn't get elected into Congress, because again, most of them were slaves, or most people didn't see them as equal. Um, and again, does that change the second slavery gets abolished? No, absolutely not. Uh, but it was a step in the right direction. And then obviously we know now people are making headways in terms of who gets elected and who isn't. Uh, we've had our first like Native American, I think, elected um, into Congress or appointed to a huge position. You have gay Americans that are elected, disabled. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely changed than it was, you know, 100 or even 200 years ago. But in the 1870s to have African Americans that were being elected to Congress, again, was a really big deal and a step towards the right direction. Because Congress is supposed to represent all of us. And so if you don't see everybody in Congress, it's kind of hard to, to you know, figure out whether or not that representation is actually real or really does exist. But we're, it's really going to kind of um, make life really hard for African Americans, or excuse me, African Americans. It's going to be that Reconstruction period. So what we call that post-Civil War, so 1865 to 1877, becomes known as Reconstruction. And at the time, the federal government had put troops in the South because they wanted to basically keep an eye on everything that was going on. They knew the South was not happy that they lost, lost the war, they lost their slaves. So they're like, we've got to keep an eye on these people because if anyone gets an idea that we want to sort of, you know, try a civil war again or, or try, you know, basically seceding from the Union again, we're going to have to make sure that we put some type of stop to that. And so as a result, federal troops are going to be put in. Uh, but the election of 1877 is going to become really contentious in between whether or not the Democrats are going to win or the Republicans. And the deal basically gets made behind closed doors where we're like, you know what, we're going to let Rutherford B. Hayes take this election. But in return, we want troops gone from the South. And that's when the military is officially going to leave the South, and then they're going to kind of have an opportunity to do things the way that they want to do them. And as a result, they're going to institute Jim Crow laws, which we could become known as segregation laws, in which they're going to prevent blacks from achieving equality. So blacks and whites can go to separate schools, and that's considered equal. Blacks and whites can go to separate doctors. They, you know, they eat in different parts of a restaurant. They sit in different parts of the bus, so on and so forth. Um, and, of course, this is going to be challenged in a very famous case that becomes known as Plessy versus Ferguson. Homer Plessy, who was one-eighth black, um, in pictures he looks pretty white. But in the South, there was this idea of what we call the one-drop rule, that if you had, like, any sort of black ancestry in you, then you yourself were automatically considered black. So in 1892, Homer Plessy is going to sit in an all-white railway car. Um, so this is, you know, railroads were big. We didn't necessarily, well, not necessarily. We didn't have planes. You know, cars weren't really a thing. But you still have railroads. And railway cars were segregated. So Homer Plessy in 1892, he's going to take a stand and challenge these Jim Crow laws by sitting in an all-white railway car. And again, he did this intentionally with the hopes of challenging these Jim Crow laws. And this is going to go to the Supreme Court in 1896, and the Supreme Court is going to rule that separate but equal is constitutional. So you can have a railway car specifically for black people and a railway car specifically for um, white people. Separate but equal is constitution. constitutional. Excuse me. So blacks and whites can go to separate schools. Separate but equal is constitutional because, again, they have access to the exact same books. Uh, they can go to separate doctors, separate but equal, constitutional. Because, again, they both have access to a doctor. And, again, this is the segregation laws that are really going to be enforced for the next 60 years. So it's going to enforce separation of different racial groups in county, community, or establishment. Um, but we also know that separate but equal isn't really constitutional. You can look at the cartoon here. You can see, like, the white fountain. It's quite nice. The black fountain, not so much. But these are also some other pictures of segregation that exist. So you had restrooms where whites would go to one, color would go to another. You'd see here, private pool says members only. You could tell if they're all white, blacks can't get in. Even the picture on the right, you can see the different water fountains. The whites look quite nice, the blacks not so much. So even though the Supreme Court had ruled separate but equal is constitutional, we know that even though it's separate, it's certainly not equal. And unfortunately, for the next 60 years, these are really going to be the law of the land until you start seeing challenges with Brown versus Boer and Loving versus Virginia. Cases like that that are going to challenge these segregation laws in the Supreme Court. 
And really kind of beginning post the 1900s, there's going to be a push for desegregation. So the NAACP, which is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, that's going to be officially created in like 1909. And W.E.B. Du Bois is going to be one of the founders of the NAACP. W.E.B. Du Bois is a really interesting guy. I know I talked about him last semester, but we do have some new students here. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois, he was the first black man to graduate for Har from Harvard, to which he said it was Harvard's pleasure. He also wrote a really great book in 1903 called The Soul of Black Folk. And in that book, he talks about this idea of what we call a double consciousness. And he's like, you know, when we talk about America, things that come to mind are like freedom, the ability to do what you want, so on and so forth. But he's like, there's this double consciousness in America and that that idea of freedom doesn't exist for everybody. If you're a white American, absolutely, you have freedom. But if you're a black American, it's this double consciousness of you don't have access to freedom like everybody else. You're living in a segregated society. And then Ida Tarbell is going to come up with this idea of what she calls a triple consciousness. What it's like to be black and American and a woman is also a very different experience. Because at the time that the NAACP was created, women still at this time did not have the right to vote. And Thurgood Marshall, who's going to become a huge attorney, is going to lead the NAACP, especially throughout the 40s, 50s, as well as the 60s. And one of their big things was going to be to push for desegregation of schools. What they kind of understood is that if you can give everyone equal access to a good education, chances are they were going to kind of be able to pick themselves up by the bootstraps and make something of themselves. So they're really going to push for schools to be desegregated. They sort of felt like if we can start there, then slowly but surely we can start to make things better for all Americans, not just colored folk, essentially. Um, and so as a result, they're really going to push for desegregation in schools. And the case that's really going to come to the forefront on this is Brown versus Board of Education, which you guys have looked at in the Warren Court PowerPoints. Um, but because it is such a big case, we are going to talk about it again. So Linda Brown, who was living in Topeka, Kansas, she was a third grader. And there was a school about four blocks away from her house. And you guys should know, you typically go to the school that's closest to your house, unless you're going to like a specific program or something. So if you're like an IB kid and you live in sort of the Elsinore High School territory, you might transfer to Temesco Canyon specifically for that program. You know, or if you're like Health Academy or something. Again, those programs are, don't exist at Lakeside and Elsinore High, so maybe you're in those territories, you know, for those schools, but then you end up transferring over. Well, little, little Brown, you know, she's four blocks away from her closest elementary school. That should be the school that she goes to. Well, no, she couldn't go to that school because it was an all-white school. And so she ended up having to go to a school that was miles away. Um, she had to walk. She had to go through the railroad tracks. It frankly just wasn't safe. So as a result, her dad decided to go ahead and sue the school district as well as with several other families. And then, of course, this is eventually going to go to the Supreme Court because the NAACP is going to get on board with the parents who are going to sue um, the Topeka um, School District. And when it goes to the Supreme Court, they do something that's really kind of unprecedented. Typically, when the Supreme Court makes a ruling in a case, it's very hard for the Supreme Court to overturn its own rulings. It does happen, but it's, it doesn't happen very often. And so with Brown versus Board, they basically look back to that Plessy versus Ferguson case in 1896. And the Supreme Court ruled that segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. They said separate but equal is not constitutional. We know that back in 1896, they said it was. It was okay for blacks and whites to sit in separate railway cars. It was okay for blacks and whites to use separate restrooms and stuff. But that's not equal. Nobody can look at those pictures of those water fountains and go, everyone's got the same water fountain. Or look at the schools and go, everyone has the same schools or the access to the same books or the access to the same exact things. The Supreme Court went, no, actually they don't. The separate but equal concept, it has got to go. Separate but equal is not constitutional. And this is really huge. Brown versus Board was not the first Supreme Court case to rule this. Um, one of the big ones was actually in California in 1948. It was Westminster versus Mendez. Um, and this is out in Westminster, which over, is over in Orange County, not far from where we live. Um, but Mexican kids were getting segregated in schools. And, of course, parents are going to sue. This is going to make its way to the Supreme Court in California. And they ruled, no, this is not okay. You cannot segregate. There was a case a couple of years before Brown um, 
was a painter, sweat versus painter. And it was a black kid in Texas who was going to law school. He was the only black kid at the law school. And, you know, they would put him in a classroom by himself with books. And they were like, hey, look, he's got access to an education. Supreme Court ruled, no, he doesn't. He's by himself. He doesn't have any professors, like, listening to him or teaching him. Like, clearly this is not okay. So Brown versus Board wasn't the first case to rule that separate but equal was unconstitutional, but it's definitely the biggest one and one that's definitely had a lasting impact on our education system. The problem with Brown versus Board was that it didn't tell the Southern states when these schools should segregate. So it was like, hey, you should segregate, but never like really actually gave them a deadline or a time to do so. So it wasn't until 1957 that Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas became the first school that actually tried to integrate. Um, so yeah, so it took three years after Brown versus Board of Education for the first school in the South to actually try to try to integrate. The reason it was Central High School was that the local chapter of the NAACP there was quite strong, and they kept pressuring Little Rock, um, the city, to you know finally integrate, to finally listen to the Supreme Court and saying, hey. Brown versus Board ruled that separate but equal was unconstitutional. They ruled, hey, we have to integrate, so therefore you need to start doing it. And they went ahead and decided to experiment with that with the Little Rock, Arkansas um, Central High School case. It becomes known as the Little Rock Nine because there's going to be a total of nine students that try to integrate into the school. Uh, but as you could probably guess, things didn't go too well. Orville Faubus, who was the governor of Arkansas at the time, he refused to let the nine students in, and he's actually going to send in the Arkansas National Guard to keep them out of the school. So their first day of school is supposed to take place on September 4th of 1957. They show up, and the National Guard refuses to let the kids in. Um, we're going to watch a video in a second. Unfortunately, not all the kids were together. Um, Elizabeth Eckford is unfortunately going to be left by herself. So I'm actually going to watch that clip first. What about you, sir? Do you think the college students will show up? If I got anything to do with it, they won't show up. Well, I think it's a breaking point of the school integration. I just don't uh, feel that they have a right to go to school. It is easy to believe today that we are an enlightened society, free from problems of race, gender, or economic separation. But some of the most difficult lessons we learn are a result of individuals who push us through these divisive barriers. In September of 1957, nine black school children, the eldest only 17, forced us through such a blockade. They sought a better education for themselves and the opportunity to pursue the American dream. This is Central High School, Little Rock, Arkansas. Troops, which for nearly three weeks lined the sidewalk here in front of the high school under orders to keep the colored students out, have been replaced now from their orders to comply with the law, which means let the Negro students in if they come in. We were Terrence Roberts, Jefferson Thomas, Thelma Mothershed, Elizabeth Eckford, Ernest Green, Carlotta Walls, Melba Patillo, Minnie Jean Brown, and Gloria Ray. They became known as the Little Rock Nine. The 1954 Supreme Court ruling on Brown versus the Board of Education found segregation of schools unconstitutional. But as the Little Rock Nine approached the high school, segregationists swarmed the campus. They got no business out here. <laughs> this is our school, not theirs. They are, they are their own. As the violence escalated, one schoolgirl, Elizabeth Eckford, was threatened by an angry mob chanting, lynch her, lynch her. President Dwight Eisenhower intervened in Little Rock and set a precedent for our nation as a whole. Such an extreme situation has been created in Little Rock. This challenge must be met, and with such measures as will preserve to the people as a whole their lawfully protected rights in a climate permitting their free and fair exercise. In the present case, the troops are there pursuant to law solely for the purpose of preventing interference with the orders of the court. On September 25, 1957, the 101st Airborne Division and 10,000 National Guard troops escorted the Little Rock Nine as they walked bravely past screaming mobs and made their way to the classrooms of Little Rock Central High School. Just got a report here on this end that the students are in. Do you feel it's worth it going through this? Yes, I do. 
these nine heroes were willing to step forward and in doing so alter the course of history. Marquette University is honored to bestow upon them the Pierre Marquette Discovery Award for this extraordinary contribution. So you can see here in the left-hand corner there, that right there is Elizabeth Eckford. Um, so on the day that the Little Rock Nine essentially went to their first day of school, they decided that they were all going to go together, kind of figured it would be best for their safety. Unfortunately, Elizabeth Eckford never got the message that they were supposed to meet at one person's house and then all go to school together. So the eight had arrived. They, of course, weren't able to be let in because the Arkansas National Guard was there to keep them out. And then Elizabeth Eckford had arrived by herself. The dress that she was wearing was a dress that she had made herself, so it was homemade. Um, she was, of course, swarmed, people chanting lyncher. They were spitting on her constantly. Um, you know, the, the dress that she wore, she ended up never wearing it again because it was so, like, damaged with, like, spit and stuff like that. Like, she just didn't have the heart to wear it. It took another three weeks before Eisenhower decided to go, hey, the Supreme Court has ruled. We have to integrate. So, you know what? I'm going to send in the National Guard that's going to override the Arkansas National Guard to ha you know, make sure that these kids are able to get in. And that's going to be the 101st Airborne. So three weeks later, after they attempted to go in on their first day of school, the Little Rock Nine is officially let in, uh, but they're going to have National Guard escorts with them for the entire year. Elizabeth Eckford uh, ended up dropping out in the middle of the year. After a few months, she frankly couldn't handle it. Uh, you know, you had kids who would be like, oh, something smells. And they were like specifically talking about the black students. They would throw things at them. They would beat them. You know, on the day that the kids actually officially got to enter, you had parents chanting outside the school, two, four, six, eight, we don't want to integrate. Um, so Elizabeth Eckford ended up dropping out, but the other eight remained. Ernest Green, who was the oldest of the group and um, a senior at the time, he's going to become the first black student to graduate from Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. There was actually a movie made by Disney Channel um, back in the early 90s about it called The Ernest Green Story. And I think the whole thing is on YouTube. And it's like one of those that hasn't been discovered yet as copyrighted. So if that's a, a movie that you're interested in watching, I would recommend it. Um, something else that I have for you guys to read about The Little Rock Nine when you go into the content of the week beneath this lecture, you'll see a thing that says Warriors Don't Cry. This is written by Melba um, Patillo. Um, she was the youngest member of the Little Rock Nine, so she was 15 when she officially entered the school. Um, she wrote a memoir about her first year in, in Little Rock, or at Central High School, I should say. And the chapter that I have um, listed there was basically the first day of school when they officially got to enter. It's a really great book. Um, I just kind of listed the first chapter for you guys to read. I think it's enticing. Um, you don't have to read it, but if you're kind of interested a little bit more of, you know, what they experience on their first day of school, um, I, would, I would highly recommend that you read that excerpt because it, it gives you a very good idea as to what these kids faced. I mean, think about it. You know, we talk about how hard of a year that we've had this past year, but you never had to worry about, you know, parents beating you simply because of the color of your skin. So it's, it's, uh, it's definitely a big change from 60, 70 years ago.